All right, I think we're going to get started. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to this um, session today of COVID-19 and the law. I'm Emily Broadleave, and along with Professor Martha Minow, I've been hosting this colloquium series throughout the semester. Um, Professor Minow and I developed this series as a forum for discussion on the many ways in which legal rules and practices are being tested and responding to the changes brought on by COVID-19. We are aimed to bring together members of the HLS community while we are all remote and far flung in order to explore and assess the legal responses to COVID-19 across areas of law, ranging from health and healthcare to regulation of labor, safety, finance and debt, immigration, criminal justice, election law, um, protection of basic human needs, and the scope and limitations of governmental powers operating in a pandemic. Uh, we're particularly concerned with how the pandemic especially burdens marginalized communities, and thus we aim to examine how the pandemic shines a spotlight on inequality, uh, frailties in our social protection systems, and how law and policy decisions have shaped and continue to shape these systems and the COVID response. So I want to say a huge thank you to um, uh, Dean Manning for supporting the series, to Professor Minow for her partnership and inspiration, and to the amazing HLS expert speakers that we have today and throughout this series, um, as well as our teaching fellows. Um, I just want to make a couple quick announcements and sort of housekeeping before I turn it over to our speakers for today. First, as a reminder, this session is being recorded. After the session, you can find the recordings online on our a website that goes along with this colloquium, which is at covidseries.law.harvard.edu. Uh, the site also hosts a blog that's going to be dynamically updated throughout the semester, and we will actually have some of our posts going live this week from our student bloggers. Um, we'd love for you to ask questions today. In order to do that, we have turned off the chat function, but you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And when I turn it over, we'll be able to moderate and leave those questions into the discussion. And lastly, I just want to make a special announcement about another opportunity that we're making available, thanks to Professor Viscomi. Um, Professor Viscomi and the staff and students in the Harvard Negotiation and Mediation Clinical Program have offered to host some small group facilitated conversations on topics included in the colloquium um, in order to create more space for dialogue about some of the topics um, and allow for reflection and community building. The sessions will take place on Thursdays, the day following the colloquium for the following <coughs> topics. Um, prisons and incarcerated populations, immigration and detention centers, and access to justice and legal innovation. So those are all coming up in the next few weeks. Um, and you can email Professor Viscomi to sign up for those. Um, for our session today, I'm so excited. Um, I think this is just such a vital set of topics that we're going to be talking about and exploring um, where we are in terms of legal considerations, in terms of policies related to the impact of COVID-19 on labor and employment. Um, we'll talk about challenges in protecting workers through common law to court and governmental regulation, enforcement both by OSHA at the federal level and then what states have done to fill in some gaps. Um, things like workers' compensation, paid leave, uninsur unemployment insurance, um, and really worker power and action in the midst of the pandemic. So I want to thank our speakers. I'm going to turn it over to um, Professor John Goldberg, who I want to thank especially because he's doing double duty today as both a speaker and moderator. Um, so uh, thank you so much, and I look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Emily. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks to uh, everyone for uh, joining this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is John Goldberg. I am a member of the faculty at uh, Harvard Law School, and I am, as Emily said, moderating and also uh, going to make some remarks. Uh, my co-panelists, who I will introduce briefly, are uh, Sharon Block, who is the executive director of the Labor and Work Life Program at uh, HLS and previously served as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy at the U.S. Department of Labor and Senior Counsel to the Secretary of Labor. Uh, and uh, my colleague Ben Sachs, who is the Faculty Co-Director of the Labor and Work Life Program uh, and is the Kestenbaum Professor of Labor and Industry at Harvard and is among the world's leading scholars on labor law and labor relations. 
Um, so here's how we're going to do things. I'm going to say a few words to start about tort liability, uh, which is my expertise and how it connects to um, uh, workplace safety. I'm then going to turn it over to Sharon uh, and then Ben, and then we'll take some questions if there's time. So I'm now taking off my uh, moderator hat and putting on my panelist hat. Um, tort law. So uh, the first thing to point out about tort law in this domain is um, uh, the bargain that was struck back at the turn of the 20th century, um, in which, uh, as a result of which, tort law has largely um, receded uh, from dealing with the problem of workplace accidents. Prior to, call it 1910, if a worker were injured, on the job and uh, uh, could, uh, uh, the, the worker could sue the employer for negligence typically, and if the, the worker could prove negligence could get tort damages. That uh, proved to be <clears throat> problematic and complicated for all sorts of reasons, including uh, shockingly employees don't tend to like to sue their employers, um, doesn't bode well for future employment relations. So um, uh, what happened uh, in the early part of the 20th century is negligence law and tort law for workplace accidents was replaced by workers' compensation schemes. And the, the, the bargain that was struck, essentially a political bargain that was struck was um, employees could now receive benefits uh, uh, through insurance schemes set up by their employers for workplace injuries. Um, they wouldn't have to prove fault, it's a kind of strict liability, if you will. <clears throat> but their uh, damages would also be fairly limited as compared to the damages they might recover in theory if they could win their negligence suits. So we now have workers' comp governing workplace accidents and uh, the workplace comp rules specify that once you um, uh, are eligible for uh, workplace compensation, you are no longer permitted to bring a negligence suit. You are barred from bringing a negligence suit for a workplace injury. So tort has been displaced uh, by workers' comp uh, uh, to a large extent. So the first question then to ask is, what is uh, workers' comp doing in this domain, in the COVID domain? Um, now, there's a big challenge here, which is workers' comp is all about workplace injuries. And uh, even before COVID, there were questions that came up when a worker would, or an employee, would come down with um, an infectious disease, such as a seasonal flu or something like that, um, because um, uh, it wasn't always clear, indeed was often unclear, whether the flu was a contracted as part and parcel of uh, working or being on the job. And so because workers' comp is about injuries that happen at the workplace, uh, plaintiff, uh, uh, claimants often face challenges uh, in establishing that their infectious disease really was attributable to their workplace. And, a version of that is certainly uh, a, a, a big worry and a big concern for uh, coverage in the COVID era. So um, uh, in, uh, under most states workers, and this is all state law, under most states workers compensation schemes, a worker is gonna have to show that um, uh, her, uh, his or her COVID illness uh, was uh, resulting from COVID contracted on the job. And that can be tough given that individuals are often exposed to multiple sources, whether it's from other family members, going to a restaurant, going to a store, what have you. And so there are some uh, uh, obstacles to recovery just in terms of establishing that uh, a, a worker who comes down with COVID did so as a result of workplace conditions. A number of states have responded to this quandary already, roughly 15 states, I believe, um, have adopted uh, what a sort of presumption or rebuttable presumption that uh, if you are a certain kind of worker um, uh, and you come down with COVID, we'll presume that uh, uh, this, uh, you contracted it at work. Different states have uh, different rules about when this presumption kicks in. Some apply it only to healthcare workers, other apply it to a broader range of essential services workers. But uh, that's going to be a key issue in all of these cases is whether there is a presumption and if not, um, whether individual workers are going to be able to establish the workplace nexus sufficient to um, recover benefits. All right. um, so that's a very simplistic account of sort of the, what seems so far to be the main issue that's coming up under the heading of workers' compensation. What about tort law? Is there any role left 
uh, for tort law? Uh, and the short answer is there, there is, but not much. Uh, and here's why. First of all, um, the bar on tort suits brought by employers, uh, employees against employers uh, is uh, limited to accidents. So if there a, a, can be a showing of some kind of intentional wrongdoing on the part of an employer, the employee um, could still bring a tort suit. Um, that's a pretty high bar. Most courts have construed that uh, exception pretty narrowly. So it has to be the kind of thing where a particular employer sets out to injure a particular employee, um, uh, which is uh, unlikely to be the case in a COVID type of scenario, though not impossible. Another line of tort cases that is now being litigated and um, is probably more fruitful, potentially at least, um, are claims for what the, the, the tort of public nuisance, as it's called. Uh, a number of uh, workers or uh, unions have brought claims against particular employers, and these include uh, McDonald's restaurants, uh, meat processing plants like Smithfield, uh, and Amazon warehouses. Um, and these suits, uh, in part to avoid any problems with the workers' comp bar, do not seek damages. These are not suits for compensatory damages, by and large. Instead, these are lawsuits seeking injunctive relief, court orders requiring uh, uh, employers to change workplace conditions in certain respects to make them safer by creating greater distances between employees or providing protective equipment or what have you. Now, the theory of liability in these cases for injunctive relief, as I mentioned, is um, the tort of public nuisance. Um, uh, it's a very ill-defined tort, um, sort of by design. It's meant to uh, in incorporate or capture a diverse array of phenomena. But the basic idea of a public nuisance is somebody's engaged in activity that interferes with what is commonly referred to as a right held in common by all members of the public or many members of the public. So classic examples of public nuisances are uh, the blockage of roads so that members of the public can't use a road anymore. Or um, um, uh, somewhat more salaciously, the running of an illegal brothel um, is considered a public nuisance. Um, it sort of interferes with people's ability to enjoy public spaces or what have you. And at least sometimes courts have said that unsanitary conditions that threaten to spread infectious disease can constitute a public nuisance. So these claims are not uh, by any means sort of ungrounded in precedent, um, uh, although they are, they push it in, uh, they push it forward in certain ways. And so the plaintiffs have come into court in these cases and basically said, maintaining an unsafe workplace with respect to the risks of COVID infection is a public nuisance. Um, uh, and that therefore it's a tort and they're entitled to injunctive relief, a court order that the conditions be changed. We're still in the earliest stages of this litigation and lower courts have come out both ways. Some courts have said quite right, this is a public nuisance injunction granted. Other courts have said, no, doesn't meet the, the definition of public nuisance or even if it does, um, uh, we're not going to grant a preliminary injunction. So uh, it's still unfolding, uh, but the, the, some plaintiffs have had success with these type of claims for uh, at least getting courts to order workplaces to uh, adopt some at least very basic uh, safety precautions. Last thing I'll say uh, about torts, and then I'm going to turn it over to Sharon. Um, there's an interesting set of questions about what happens if an employee um, is uh, exposed to COVID uh, at the workplace and then goes home at, or leaves the workplace and transmits it to someone else, such as a family member or a, a, a roommate or uh, what, what have you. Um, can those third parties, meaning non-employees, do they have a claim against the employers saying, you didn't do a very good job of maintaining a safe workplace. One of your employees got sick as a result and now I, who have no relation to you whatsoever, uh, the employer, uh, I should be able to sue you. The interesting thing about these claims is workers' comp has nothing to do with these claims. Workers' comp is about claims by employees against employers. So if you're not an employee, you're free to sue uh, the company for negligence, um, uh, just like employees used to be able to do. And so there's an interesting question of whether employers will start to face tort liability and negligence liability not 
to their, their employees, but to third parties uh, who receive, who uh, are infected as a result of employees being infected. There's some interesting cases here. There is a line of cases, and again, the courts have split on this, where, for example, a worker who is exposed to a toxic substance such as asbestos um, carries it home on his or her clothing, and then somebody in the household is injured because of the asbestos on the clothing. A number of courts uh, have said, yes, the employer owes a duty to, for example, family members of an employee to make sure that the employee does not endanger the family members by bringing dangers home with him or her from work, the workplace. And if those lines of cases can be successfully invoked by plaintiffs, we might actually see a fair bit of negligence liability, ironically, not to the employees who are exposed, uh, but to uh, uh, family members and friends with whom they come into contact. So more to, more to come on that. All right, that's a very hurried uh, 30,000 foot overview of some of the basic uh, developments in tort law and workers' comp. Um, and I'm now gonna turn it over to Sharon to talk more about the uh, regulatory side. So Sharon, the floor is yours. Thank you, John. Um, and so Ben and I are gonna talk now about sort of framing around two sets of challenges for workers during COVID. The first challenge is how to stay safe on the job for workers who are either essential and have been working throughout the pandemic or as the economy has started to open up, uh, workers who are compelled by their employers to keep their jobs to come um, into the workplace. And then the other set of challenges is, is around what happens to workers when they can't work, either because their job has uh, disappeared, um, you know, just, just to sort of set that context, we lost approximately uh, over 20 million jobs um, at the beginning of the pandemic, and only about half of those jobs have come back, so we still have very high rates of unemployment. Um, or they can't work because they're sick, or somebody in their family is sick. So it's staying safe on the job, and then what happens to you um, if you can't work? And I'm going to focus on sort of three different areas where the government, um, where we have governmental programs that are supposed to protect workers um, in these kinds of situations. I'm gonna talk about occupational safety and health, the unemployment um, insurance program and paid leave. And I think it helps to keep in mind sort of some real world um, situations and in, in, um, imagining how these programs are working or not working. Cause I think that's gonna be the theme throughout is that uh, we're looking at how well these protections in the law are working or not. Um, so think about like meat packing workers, what they've gone through. They had to work um, at the beginning of the pandemic we're compelled to come in, we're made essential workers, and there's been ex, you know, just an explosion of cases in that context. And then another sort of typical situation through this pandemic that shows how these programs are working or not are like retail workers, many of whom can't work because they work um, in, in workplaces that have shut down as a result. Um, of the pandemic. So first I'm going to start with occupational safety and health. Um, I'm going to give a little foreshadowing. It's not working, our, our regulatory system that has been um, set up. So we have a basic uh, federal law, the Occupational Safety and Health Act was passed in the 70s, uh, signed by President Nixon. Um, and it, it creates an a responsibility for employers to provide a safe and healthful workplace for all workers. Uh, the, uh, so the Occupational Safety and Health Administration is then supposed to set standards that give the um, sort of the rules of the road of how that, that those responsibilities play out, how to address particular hazards, known hazards in workplaces. But over all of that is this what's called the general duty to provide a safe and healthful workplace. So this is obviously the pandemic is something that had never happened before, although had been um, predicted by many people in the occupational safety and health uh, realm for a long time. But we came to the pandemic without a specific standard um, on how to protect workers in the workplace. Um, there were immediately calls for OSHA to issue what's called an emergency temporary standard, which is just to get those rules out quickly so that workers could be sure that their employers were being held accountable and told how to create a safe workplace. So far, 
um, OSHA has refused despite lawsuits, despite calls from Capitol Hill, um, from workers, has refused to issue an emergency temporary standard to address the particular threat um, that workers face in the workplace. Instead, OSHA has issued sort of voluntary guidance They've directed employers to look at CDC guidance, but what's important to remember about all of this is that workers cannot enforce the particular elements of this guidance um, or ask OSHA to enforce those particular um, strategies or guidelines uh, because they are not, they're not standards, they are just guidance. Um, so they have to rely on this general duty that employers have. Uh, OSHA's received about 10,000 complaints about COVID hazards uh, since the pandemic started. They've opened only about 200 inspections of workplaces and issued COVID-related citations to about 40 employers. Um, they've issued, so what happens is if an employer is found to have violated um, this responsibility to provide a safe and helpful workplace, they have to pay a fine. Um, in these about 40 cases where they've found violations, OSHA hasn't issued any penalties above about $28,000, even in workplaces, again, you know, remembering our, our meatpacking example, where dozens and dozens of workers have died in some of these plants, um, hundreds or thousands of workers have been infected in some of them. Um, and an interesting study just came out, of course, by an epidemiologist here at Harvard, at public health school, found that complaints to OSHA to have peaked, both looking nationally and in different geographic areas, have peaked shortly before COVID deaths peak. And so these are, which suggests that these are not frivolous complaints that workers are filing, but they're actually seeing real hazards in their workplace. They're filing these complaints. OSHA's not doing anything. And so people are continuing to get, to get sick. Um, another part of what OSHA is supposed to do is to protect workers from retaliation. If they raise safety concerns, they're supposed to be protected from any adverse consequences for raising those concerns with their employers. Um, again, we've had about more than 1,700 retaliation complaints, COVID-related complaints filed. Only about 2% so far have been um, investigated and resolved. And um, OSHA is not providing a lot of information about these complaints, so it's hard to tell how any of those resolutions have come out. But again, there have been some um, high-profile examples of workers being fired because they've raised safety concerns. So with this void of, federal, of protection at the federal level, we're starting to see states step into the breach. Um, in some states through executive actions, but Virginia actually recently became the first state to issue a comprehensive COVID specific workplace safety standard. So that's something for workers in Virginia, they can hold, you know, they can use it to hold their employer accountable. It gives employers very specific information about what they are supposed to do to keep their workers safe. Oregon is moving in the same direction. Um, and California actually already had on its books what they call an airborne disease standard. So already in California, employers should have been keeping their um, employees safe. I wanna quickly now go to unemployment insurance compensation. It's, I'll try to do it quickly. It's a complicated system of a partnership between state law and federal law. Um, Generally, the UI system, the unemployment insurance system, is run by the states. They set benefit levels, they set the duration of benefits, they set the system by which you apply for benefits. The federal government is supposed to set sort of minimum standards and then provides grants to pay for the administration, or at least part of the administration of the program. Um, so in most states, the basic system is, is six months of unemployment benefits. If you're out of work for six months, you can get some level of wage replacement. Um, in some states, it's very low. In other states, it's a little bit higher. In no state is it, is it a complete replacement of your wages during your period of unemployment. You, of course, have an obligation to try to find new employment. 
in the CARES Act, which was the pandemic relief bill that passed early in the pandemic, created a federal pandemic employment compensation program. This is not unusual in a time of high unemployment. You will have the federal government will, will step in and say, we're going to kick in some extra benefits because this is such a burden for the states when you have high unemployment during recessions. So here, Congress did it a little bit differently. They said, you know what, we're going to give $600 of federal money to every unemployed person. That went on until July, as you probably know from watching the news, that extra federal benefit ran out in July. And so now people are having to rely just on that basic state level of um, benefit. The other interesting thing, really interesting thing that Congress did um, was for the first time, usually to get unemployment, you have to be an employee. That leaves out a lot of people who don't actually uh, qualify as employees, um, think independent contractors, um, gig workers. It's, many of them are probably our employees, but they're treated as not employees. Anyway, Congress created the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. It's the first time we've ever had federal UI program for non-employees. It also covers other people who don't qualify for the basic state program. So that's going to be people who exhausted their benefits already because they had already been unemployed for more than six months. Uh, they might not have worked enough yet. There's sort of uh, a basic number of hours you have to work to have qualified. Um, that program runs through the end of the year. And again, if Congress doesn't do anything before the end of the year, that program will also go away. Um, I also want to just touch quickly on how these programs affect undocumented workers. And the quick answer is that undocumented workers are excluded from all of these programs. They were excluded from the $1,200 basic benefit. They can't get UI benefits. Again, this is a place where states have stepped in. California has a program where they provide a $500 payment to undocumented workers who lose their jobs. Um, the last thing to say about the UI system is like this all sounds great that you get money if you're unemployed, especially during a recession when there's so many un unemployed people and it takes so it's taking people so long to find jobs because, as I said at the outset, still have about 10 million jobs that haven't come back. There's a huge problem with administration in the in the UI system. Um, it is taking there. There's actually a study that came out done by folks at the Kennedy School today showing the incredible lag time in people getting benefits. Again, these are programs that are run at the state level, so they have to be funded in part by this grant from the federal government, but also by appropriations from state legislatures. And we are we're seeing now data that there are um, huge percentages of workers in some states who are six months into this pandemic who still haven't started receiving their UI benefits. This is in part uh, due to antiquated um, IT systems that just are not capable of keeping up with this incredible um, onslaught um, input of UI claims. If you follow this each week, across the country, we're seeing between eight and 900,000 um, new UI claims being filed across the country. So it's just an administrative nightmare. But it's also just to get you to think about sort of how policy um, and, and administration work together, uh, built into the UI system are, are um, requirements and um, assessments that all point the system towards prioritizing fraud prevention. Not a lot of incentives to drive a system towards prompt payments. And there's lots of policy choices that are made that can shift the way that the system works. And so now we're seeing that this, this long trend of um, measuring the success of state's UI systems based on how well they detect fraud are creating a lot of obstacles to benefits, which with this high number of claims is making it very, very difficult for states to get benefits out and people are really um, suffering as a result. Um, last thing I wanna to touch quickly on is paid leave. 
Um, as you may know, um, before the pandemic, the United States was the only or one of two countries in the world that had no paid leave program. That's not industrialized countries. That's not advanced economies. That's of any countries in the world. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, though, we the Congress did pass the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which for the first time created um, a federal paid leave program. That's great if you support paid leave programs. Um, it's two weeks of paid sick leave to cover if you're a worker and you get sick yourself, and it's up to 10 weeks of paid leave for you to take care of a family member who gets sick. Um, there are a lot of exclusions and exemptions. I can go into more detail if people have questions, but just so you understand that it, it is a fairly limited program. It only covers companies that have fewer than 500 workers. Um, and if you have, if you work for a company that has fewer than 50 workers, chances are your employer has chosen to opt out. There's a very easy opt out of the program. So it's a big step forward um, in terms of paid leave in this country, but it is a pretty limited program. States again have stepped in. There's 13 states in the District of Columbia that require employers to provide paid sick leave and four states that have paid medical leave. So in those states, workers have been and continue to be able to get more robust benefits if they, need, if they get COVID themselves or have to take care of somebody who has it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Ben, uh, it's all yours. Great. So um, there's there's clearly a role for uh, tort law here. Um, there's clearly a role for administration. But I think as John and Sharon's comments uh, reveal, um, we're not uh, doing the job <laughs> with these mechanisms. We're not uh, making sure that workplaces are safe and healthy during this pandemic through tort suits and OSHA. And so the question is, what mechanism do we have that might actually work? Um, and in our view, and I'll, 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 our here, we'll refer to Sharon and me, although John probably agrees. Um, the best mechanism that we have for this is the collective voice and power of workers themselves, uh, traditionally, uh, though not always, exercised through unions. That is to say, when workers are in unions and have the power and voice to demand safe and healthy workplaces, that, that's what tends to actually work. So some, some quick statistics on this. Um, Sharon talked about OSHA. Um, OSHA is uh, good in theory, hasn't worked so well in practice. Um, the exception is with uh, workplaces that are unionized. So um, some of the best research we have on this question shows that large employers are nearly 80% likelier to be inspected by OSHA if they're unionized. There's a number of industry specific studies that show that the presence of a union raises the probability of compliance with OSHA regulations by about 15%. A terrific study by Allison Morantz about coal mining uh, shows that unionization is uniformly associated with a huge decline in traumatic injuries and an even larger fall in fatal injuries uh, in mines. Um, with respect to the pandemic itself, uh, there's a study by Alex Hurdle Fernandez at Columbia, uh, which shows that the one factor that stands out in distinguishing safe and unsafe workplaces is union membership. So he, uh, Alex shows that compared to non-members, union members are more likely to report always using and having a PPE while on the job, always having the opportunity to social distance while on the job, having access to paid leave, receiving employer resources for disinfection and sanitizing, and for getting tested for COVID. So those are some brief statistics that underlie the, the basic point, which is that workers' collective power, workers' collective voice is a critical mechanism for ensuring safety and health. Why, why, would, why would this be true? I mean, the, the, there's an intuitive uh, element to this, which is workers are uniquely well positioned to identify and understand the risks and hazards that they face at work. 
they're often also well positioned to, to know how to address them. And so if they're given the power to do it, they can make work more safe. The problem, the problem is that US law makes it exceedingly difficult for workers to form and join unions. And um, we could spend hours on this, but the, the result of this legal failure is that something like 7%, only 7% of workers in the United States are in a union, even though upwards of 50%, probably a lot more than that, would choose to be, one, to be in one if they could. So what this means is that we need a massive overhaul of labor law to make it easier for workers to exercise their right to form unions. That ought to be <clears throat> a key component of our effort to address the pandemic. Now, Sharon and I spent a couple years uh, running a project here at Harvard to lay out a comprehensive vision of what such an uh, overhaul of labor law would look like. We called that the Clean Slate Project. Um, and I don't have time to go into it now, um, but uh, to, to review it all now. But I, I do want to say that where we started in that, uh, that set of recommendations was with inclusion. Um, labor law has many defects, but primary among them is that it excludes workers um, on the basis of categories like agricultural workers, domestic workers, independent contractors, and undocumented workers. Th this has huge equity uh, implications. It, it means that the, the workers of color and women who most need labor laws protection are often excluded by that law. So whatever we do to fix labor law, we need to start by making it more inclusive. Now, um, there is a act pending in Congress now called the PRO Act, uh, which would do a lot of good work um, it, to making unionization more uh, uh, practically accessible to workers. Um, that hopefully will pass <laughs> in the next administration. Um, but Sharon and I have also laid out some recommended changes geared specifically to the pandemic, um, changes meant to make worker voice and, and, and power more accessible, more realizable uh, in the pandemic. And, and I, I just take a few minutes and identify some of the highlights of those recommendations. So a first, first kind of set of, of ideas is, how to address the difficulties caused by uh, the pandemic to traditional union organizing. If you have to social distance, if you have to communicate as we are today over Zoom, it becomes very difficult to organize unions in the traditional way. So one, one thing that we propose is to enhance digital communication and organizing um, among workers. So we want to require that employers create digital meeting spaces for employees to communicate outside of employer surveillance. Um, we want the government to maintain and publicly post a list of labor disputes and safety complaints. We want to make available a browser extension that would allow consumers to be notified of labor disputes and safety complaints when visiting a company's website. And we want to prohibit employer surveillance of workers digital organizing um, through a, a, a number of means. Um, the, other, um, the other thing that needs to happen in this uh, category is the NLRBs, that's the agency that runs union elections, they need to adopt their rules for elections, for union elections, uh, for remote work and social distancing. So, for example, workers need to be able to demonstrate support for unionization uh, by means of digital petitions or ballots or mail ballots and can't be required as they are uh, today to vote in person. Um, but the, 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 the sort of the heart of what needs to change, we think, is the institutional landscape of worker representation. We need to expand the range of mechanisms for worker voice. Under current law, workers have a choice between full-fledged unionization and essentially nothing, individual, individual bargaining with their employers, which means, in point of fact, uh, no voice, no power. Um, and that binary choice has led to wor most workers in the United States, now 93% of private sector workers, having no voice and no power. And so um, what, we, what we recommend to, to specifically deal with the pandemic and the safety and health uh, uh, conditions are five sets of reforms, five reforms. Um, one, all workplaces should have what we call a safety steward. 
elected by workers and insured and charged with ensuring compliance with safety and health rules. So this would be a right of every worker in every workplace in the country to have uh, a safety stored. In all workplaces too, in all workplaces of a minimum size, where there is no union, a workplace safety and health committee should be elected by workers and charged with adapting and implementing safety and health rules for that workplace, including rules established by sectoral commissions, which I'll get to in a moment. All sectors of the economy, so think fast food, hotels, uh, automotive, all sectors of the economy should have a safety and health commission charged with negotiating baseline health and safety rules for all firms in the sector. So, you, so the, the sectoral commission would establish baseline rules which would then be adapted and implemented by safety and health committees at the level of the workplace. Where possible, these sectoral commissions should involve community representatives to help address community impacts of workplace safety and health issues. And five, to ensure that all workers feel secure enough to participate in these representative structures, we have to adopt a just cause dismissal policy for all workers in the economy. As any of you who've taken employment law know, the background rule of US employment relations is at will employment. That means that employers can fire workers for any reason at all, even bad reasons. That tool, that employer uh, capacity to fire at will um, is massively detrimental to the ability of workers to stand up and demand their rights, including safe and healthy workplaces. So as part of this, this um, menu of reforms of the labor law system uh, to sort of support the ability of these workplace monitors to operate, the, the ability of the workplace committees to operate, the sectoral commissions to operate, we need to shift the rule of at will to just cause. And that would, that would just require employers to prove that they have a good reason to fire someone and complaining about safety and health concerns, demanding uh, better safety and health conditions would never constitute a good cause. Okay, so rather than going into details about all these proposals, um, which I'd be happy to do in the Q&A, I think looking at the clock, John, maybe, maybe I'll stop there and, um, and we can take questions. Great, uh, thanks to you both, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, it, is, um, it is a sobering picture at a minimum um, that we're looking at between the sort of intersection of uh, uh, sort of uh, common law and liability, regulatory law and labor law. Um, it obviously, um, I think one of the messages we're hearing is um, across all three state, all, all three of our comments is um, we've got some serious gaps um, in the legal response and legal protections. Um, I will turn to questions now, and uh, the first uh, two questions I'm going to take together because they're <clears throat> both directed at me, um, and so I will call on myself, and they're both, uh, they're related. Um, so Emma Scott has asked, um, have any right to farm laws come into play in the public nuisance suits that I mentioned against agricultural employers? Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. There's also a question um, uh, more generally about um, liability immunity statutes, which have been enacted both at, uh, enacted at the state level and discussed at the federal level. So let me say a word about each of those. Um, so right to farm laws, br very briefly speaking, are laws designed to protect farm operations from being sued as nuisances, um, to give farmers more leeway to do what they do, even if it um, bothers their neighbors. Um, which comes up a lot when you have a mixed use sort of area where there's farming, but also residences. Um, uh, I'm not aware <clears throat> at the moment of right to farm laws being trotted out by courts as a reason um, to resist categorizing certain workplaces as public nuisances, but it's certainly a possibility and something that um, in the agricultural industry, one would want to keep an eye on going forward. Um, <clears throat> more generally, on immunity. So um, a number of states right at the outset of the pandemic or early on passed uh, tort immunity provisions that were designed mainly to protect in the first instance healthcare workers and other first responders, if you will, uh, from liability. Um, uh, for example, a hospital from a medical malpractice claim based on decisions that were made about how to allocate scarce 
uh, medical resources to patients and things like that. Um, uh, the, those have become controversial because uh, they extended, often extended liability protections. It varies from state to state, but they often uh, extended protections to um, uh, nursing homes, which has obviously been one of the biggest sources of uh, infection. And um, uh, the general rule under these statutes is as long as there's been nothing that counts as quote unquote gross negligence or recklessness on the part of these entities, they can't be subject to liability. Uh, some states are actually starting to peel back on these immunities law, immunity laws, even though they were relatively recently enacted, precisely out of concerns that um, some pretty irresponsible actors may end up getting shielded from li liability under them. The US Senate has been very keen at the behest of the Chamber of Commerce and other um, uh, industry groups um, to enact a general uh, broad immunity statute uh, as a way of um, sort of protecting and maybe reviving to some extent businesses, not just uh, hospitals or nursing homes, but um, restaurants, hotels, movie theaters, etc. And the idea would, again would be uh, immunity from anything uh, short of gross negligence. Um, uh, Senator McConnell has said that he will not support any further uh, sort of uh, stimulus payments or anything like that until there's an immunity provision, a federal immunity provisions, the House Democrats uh, are not interested. So it's an impasse right now as to whether or not that's going to happen, but it's certainly conceivable that there might be federal level immunities from certain forms of tort liability uh, going forward. Um, all right, that's my best effort to answer those uh, questions. Uh, let's see, I'm just looking at scanning the next question. Um, so I'm not sure, to, maybe I'll direct this at Ben, um, but uh, uh, tell me if, uh, if I'm doing so. Daniel Polonsky asks, um, is there any bar to employers requiring employees to get vaccinated absent valid exceptions for health or religious beliefs? Um. I'm not, I don't, I, I have not heard that question before and I'm not sure, um, the, the, there may be, I, I don't, I don't, I'm, I can't think of any employment law reasons why that would be prohibited. Um, it strikes me that there may be a constitutional objection um, that uh, I would hope wouldn't carry the day, but um, it seems would probably be lurking in the background. Sharon, do you, can you think of a yeah, it comes up with actually for healthcare workers with flu vaccines, like a lot of nursing homes require their employees to get flu vaccines. And I think that's pretty much been, you know, challenges to that haven't been um, successful. You know, nurses, what I've heard from nurses and particularly from nurses unions is that they would prefer that employers request that they get vaccinated or bargain you know, that there be a union and you bargain over how that plays out. But I'm pretty sure it's been, um, employers have been successful, at least in the healthcare setting in requiring flu vaccines. And I would assume that would be the same with um, when there is a, a COVID vaccine. Great. So this next question is for either Ben or Sharon or both, because uh, it's about your project. Um, and the question is from uh, Lauren uh, Bilo or Bilo, apologies if I've mispronounced. Um, uh, in the absence of sectoral rules, how do you interest employers in making the sorts of reforms that you are advocating? Um, that's a great question. And um, I think the basic answer is you require them uh, to, to participate uh, or you, you, you establish the commissions uh, to operate by, uh, by legal mandate. And um, if the employers, you know, one, one version is if the employers don't participate, um, then uh, the, the standards get promulgated anyway. Um, which creates a rather large incentive for participation. Now, I will say, uh, Lauren, this is not exactly your question, um, but there is a significant um, non-delegation issue, uh, constitutional non-delegation issue here, um, which goes something like this. If, 
if private actors like unions and corporations um, are charged with promulgating standards, which then have the force of law. Um, there's this old uh, constitutional bar on, pri on delegating a lawmaking authority to private actors. That's something Sharon and I thought very carefully about um, uh, during this project. And um, there are ways of, of structuring uh, such uh, sectoral uh, rules, sectoral commissions um, involving Department of Labor involvement or oversight um, uh, that we think is responsive to the non-delegation problem. Um, so that's a, that's a long way of saying, we think there are ways of, of, of addressing your question, um, but, but they, they raise constitutional considerations, which we also think there are ways of addressing, um, but it's, it's complicated. And I would just add um, that if you look at countries where there are strong sectoral bargaining systems in place, they were able to deal much more quickly um, and efficiently with adapting to the pandemic. So you had negotiations both over, over um, safety provisions and over support for workers who got laid off. Um, like in European countries, in Denmark, which has a very strong labor movement, their, uh, their union density is about, I think, over 70%, whereas Ben said ours is under 7% now. Um, and at least, at the, you know, everything's changing in Europe now, and they seem to be having a spike too, but they had obviously a much more successful response to the pandemic than we did. And it created this structure where the government, the employers and workers, could quickly get together and figure out like, what do we do in this situation? And it was a very, very different um, response than we had here. So, you know, I think most employers don't like chaos and we had chaos at the outset of the pandemic and in a lot of other countries, they didn't. Just, if, John, if I may, one last thought on, on this question. Um, uh, th there is in fact a, um, a, a rational reason why employers would um, favor sectoral negotiation over um, safety and health conditions, but also uh, wages and hours and working, working conditions more broadly. Um, and that is if you do this stuff at the level of the sector, so that is to say like, for example, you had a safety and health uh, set of protocols for fast, the fast food industry as a whole, as opposed to trying to negotiate it for the individual McDonald's on, on Mass Ave. Um, you take the costs of safety and health compliance out of competition um, because the, the, the costs are borne equally by every firm in the sector. Um, and so there's, there's a kind of rational economic reason uh, why employers would, ought to prefer sectoral uh, negotiations to a workplace level negotiation. Thanks. Um, I have a question for Sharon, um, which is, uh, how does the uh, ADA, the American Disability, American with Disabilities Act, apply to workers during the pandemic? And specifically, uh, is it ever the case that working from home will count as a reasonable accommodation for workers with underlying conditions or susceptibilities? Yeah, thanks for that question. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly, if you think about the structure of the ADA, if somebody um, uh, being able to have a functioning immune system would seem to be the kind, you know, if you had, uh, if you didn't have a functioning immune system or, or a well-functioning immune system, that would seem to qualify as a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. That then kicks in the reasonable accommodation process, which means the employee and the employer is supposed to figure out whether the employee can do the essential functions of their job in a way that um, addresses their, their health concern. I don't think we've seen a lot of litigation around this, but there was an interesting district court case here in Massachusetts recently about an employee who was a social worker who had asthma um, and wanted to, I think he had started working at home, wanted to continue to work at home. The employer said, no, you have to come into the office. Um, and then the employee asked for telework as a reasonable accommodation. And the district court issued an injunction to allow this employee to continue to work from home. It's a really strong opinion. 
very a lot of very interesting um, issues came up. Um, uh, some of the interesting parts of this, the court actually looked at the high unemployment rate and the fact that the employee might lose health care if they lost their job as part of the irreparable harm analysis for the injunction, which was very interesting and really taking into account, you know, these unusual circumstances that we're in. Um, and then also looked at, because this person was a social worker, um, that the public had an interest in this employee continuing to work. So the, the injunction analysis was actually very interesting, but also the fact that working from home when you have a particular vulnerable um, vulnerability to COVID um, was, you know, was found to be a reasonable accommodation. Now it helped this employee had been working from home. So I think the employer didn't have a very strong argument to say, like, this isn't going to work. You're not going to be able to do the essential functions of your job. But I think theoretically, the ADA should, should provide protection for a lot of workers. Um, another question probably for Sharon, though, maybe for Ben as well, uh, which is, um, uh, what, uh, what, what, if anything, might spur OSHA to do more um, uh, in terms of setting standards or addressing complaints? Is there any, are there any levers for compelling administrative action um, uh, or is it a change of leadership or uh, uh, what, what, what might change OSHA's uh, performance? So, uh, so there's one obvious answer I'll try to avoid um, that I'm sure we're all thinking about. Yes, I think a change in leadership. I mean, just on the, just to, to not be glib about it, um, I think uh, former Vice President Biden has been very critical of OSHA and has publicly said that that um, he would support OSHA issuing an emergency temporary standard and increased funding for OSHA um, enforcement personnel. Um, in the House passed COVID relief bills, there has been um, a direction to OSHA to do those two things, to issue the emergency temporary standard and to increase enforcement. Um, but of course, those bills have now you know, been um, not taken up um, in the Senate. So um, it seems pretty clear that that situation will only change with a change in leadership. The AFL, the AFL-CIO, you know, Federation of, of um, Labor Unions in the United States, has sued OSHA to try to compel them to act. So far, that litigation hasn't been successful. Just one, one note on that, I, and I don't think Sharon would disagree, although she'll say if she does. <laughs> um, you know, as important as the OSHA standard is, um, there, OSHA, um, we shouldn't we shouldn't assume that it's a panacea. Um, we absolutely need need a standard. Um, we need better OSHA enforcement. But there, OSHA has lots of standards that often go under enforced and unenforced. And so, um, at least in my view. Um, without a strong, stronger labor movement, without more collective voice and power for workers, even the best OSHA standards are not going to do the job. These things are uh, work in partnership with one another. Um, and um, so we, we need both. Um, uh, yeah. Great. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. Um, this is from uh, Morgan Sandhu. Um, uh, anyone who wants to jump in. Um, is there any way in which the um, law, relevant applicable law, has um, taken account of the differential risk of COVID to employees with underlying health conditions or uh, at a higher risk due to age or et cetera? Do we see any sort of recognition that different people in the workplace are uh, situated differently with respect to uh, COVID-related risks? So, I mean, um, union collective bargaining agreements are uh, flexible enough to do this and, and, and can make that recognition and distinction. Um, the ADA case that Sharon talked about is essentially a partial answer to your question. That is to say, if an underlying health condition qualifies as a disability within the meaning of the ADA, um, then the ADA comes into play. Age is, it has not been regarded as a disability uh, within the meaning of the ADA, but it, it doesn't seem far, too far-fetched to me to, to think about whether age in relation to COVID might 
might qualify. And then there's the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, which, you know, I, I mean, I haven't seen any cases, but but is would be a, a worth thinking about in 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 this regard. Yeah, I agree. Just to add to that, I think a really interesting question that, again, I don't know that it's come up yet, but I think people are concerned and watching for it. Are employers making blanket rules about or or um, being concerned about hiring older workers or workers that they perceive as having underlying conditions and making assumptions about people's ability to work safely in the workplace and sort of preemptively excluding those workers from the workplace. So you have sort of the concerns on both sides that those workers are particularly vulnerable and they're not going to get the protection they need, but also that they're going in a time when it's really hard, especially for low wage workers to find work at all, that they're going to have another hurdle in terms of finding work because employers are going to be concerned about, about their um, ability to, to keep them safe. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sharon uh, and Ben, for um, uh, uh, your uh, wonderful presentations and uh, what I find has found to be a uh, both um, difficult but uh, very informative discussion. And obviously, we've got uh, all have a lot of work to do. So, um, uh, I think my last job as moderator is just to say thank you to all again to all of you who uh tuned in and joined us and um uh we really appreciate your time thanks very much thank you thank you thank you thank you all and thank you john <laughs>